I'm going to start off here today. We are, this is Labor Day 2018. Began over 100 and, oh, what is it, about 140 years ago, Labor Day was first celebrated actually up in New York. And before it eventually would become a, a national holidays in the 1930s, it would spread in popularity across the nation. Um, as you are with your family and friends, I pray that you are just revived tomorrow. It's amazing that we live in a country where work is celebrated by having a day off of work. Isn't that nice? I don't know about you. I, I like that. I don't mind that. Sitting at home and eating. Well, February of this past year, I had the distinct opportunity to travel to the country of Israel and tour much of the Holy Land. It was a, really, for me, it was a trip of a lifetime. It kind of sprung on me all of a sudden, this opportunity. Two months later, I'm on a plane heading over. Um, had a number of cool things to see. I had a chance to dip in the Dead Sea and hear me getting a facial. Or not. Oh, there it is. It didn't help much, as you can see, but I got one anyway. I eventually put it all over my body. It was cool. Um, had a chance to pray at the Weeping Wall in Jerusalem and um, sh- uh, sent a video back to Faith. As that was her sermon. We, um, I was blessed to be able to be baptized in the Jordan River. I'm not for the forgiveness of my sin, but I felt like I was being baptized into a new season of what God wanted to do. And um, I happened to have my Captain America shirt on, and my wife said, why did you wear that shirt? I said, baby, because we don't think about that stuff. (laughs) Crazy. And then um, I even got a chance to sail on the Sea of Galilee. It was a beautiful moment that that God allowed us to be a part of. And um, But whenever I was asked what was my favorite location, um, it was on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. It was in a town called Capernaum. It was a town called Capernaum. This is a place where Peter was from. Um, where many of the disciples were connected there. Many of Jesus' early ministries and returning ministries. This was kind of a launching place. And this is the, the temple. This is a synagogue there in Capernaum. And here I stood at a first century synagogue. This is the same synagogue that Jesus would have been standing. It was where he would have preached. Um, here in the next slide, his disciples would have sat on these benches listening to Jesus teach and they were listening to him and just a short walk away was Peter's house where Jesus would have finished here, walked over to Peter's house where his mother-in-law was and he raised her up and there she prepared a meal for them. I mean, I got to walk and stand. I got to pretend preach because nobody was there to listen to me. But I got to stand and give praise to God right where Jesus would have been standing and preaching and teaching. It was a special, special moment for me personally. And um, in fact, that miracle itself was recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. And soon um, that walk over to heal Peter's mother-in-law was recorded as well, just 50 yards away. It was um, from here to the sound booth away. It was so close to what all that was happening. But it was this type of setting that Jesus would have sat and eaten um, in this town like this. He would have talked with the closest of his followers. It was here that he shared with them one of his personal prayers that we're going to be looking at this morning. But for Jesus... His personal prayers was not just a strategy built on human ingenuity. The desires of Jesus were always connected to his heavenly Father. And I'm excited to look at this passage together as we talk about seeing with new eyes. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 9 on this Labor Day Sunday. Because the prayer of Jesus has been the same prayer of every astute and spiritual leader since, found in Matthew chapter 9. And we're going to start with verse 35. 
verse 35 through 38. And it reads as such. Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Let me say that again. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Would you bow in a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this Labor Day weekend that you have blessed us with. But yet, Lord, as we take a rest from our natural work, we are also reminded of the great work that you have called all of us to. That we, that we are your answer to prayer. That whenever you prayed this prayer, as you encouraged your spiritual leaders to pray this prayer, that, that your spirit began to circulate, to stir the hearts of men and women for generations to come for the glory of your name. And today I believe that you're still asking us to pray a similar prayer because there is a great harvest of souls yet to be brought into your kingdom for which you have died for and paid the price for. I ask you, Lord, that you would guide our steps today. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's three things that I see in this scripture here whenever Jesus, the first of which we see the work of the Lord. It says that as Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, it was actually amazing to me how close, how small these regions really were. He literally could have gone to all of the synagogues and so forth in this region. But he spoke of the work of the Lord. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. The teaching part should not surprise us because whenever the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, he himself said, teach them to obey all I have commanded you. For three and a half years, he taught his disciples. For three and a half years in public ministries, he went around at synagogues teaching the word of God, the truth of God. In fact, much of his teaching revolved around the kingdom of God and explaining who the heavenly father was his relationship to humanity, and what it meant for the Father's kingdom to come to earth. You know, sometimes I still think we, we have a slight confusion about that, that kingdoms, the kingdom of God is organizational, that the kingdom of God is structural in a building, but the Lord said, no, 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 the kingdom of God is now in the hearts of men and women. Everything else is just a tool for the kingdom of God to be established. This is why Jesus came and died to reveal the heart of the Father, to show who the Father was, and to usher in the kingdom and through the new covenant that we have with the Lord. So he ran around teaching, and he commissioned this teaching to them, but he also began to proclaim. Proclaim what? The good news, the good news that God is for you, the good news that God is not against you. Whenever the angels came, they said, this is good news for all people, right? Whenever he was born in this manger, the angels were so excited because they knew that the good news of who Jesus was and what he was bringing to earth, that it was good news for all people who would call upon his name. You know, sometimes in our, our zeal to get it right, in our zeal to teach, by the way, we teach believers, but we proclaim the good news to unbelievers. Sometimes we get this switched around, friends. And we, we, we try to teach unbelievers that are not regenerated by the work of God. We try to teach them how to obey God. You can't obey God until you've accepted the good news. And the good news, the spirit of Christ, the kingdom, has gotten into you. We need to be good newsing people. 
that God has reached out toward them, that if they would respond to his gracious call and his gracious gift upon their life, that they can be restored in relationship. They can have, as the early announcement to the shepherds was, peace to all mankind. I know there's no better day and age in his setting whenever Jesus was born or in our setting today, whenever we see the turmoil across the globe and even in our own nation where people, even our own people can't agree on basically anything. Oh, we split down the middle. Oh, peace to all men. And oh, the peace that we know whenever we are brought into right relationship with God. You can sleep at night, friends. You can have assurance even whenever you go through times of loss. I was with a family on Thursday night that um, on Saturday they had played with the grandkids, with the grandfather, Sunday morning through a Sunday, Saturday night through Sunday morning, he passed away into all eternity. Just like that. No health issues, no nothing. The grandfather went into all eternity. We don't know what tomorrow has to hold, do we? But when we know that God is holding our tomorrow, we don't have to worry about it. You know, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't just affect our todays, it affects our eternity, it provides perspective. And Jesus went around not just teaching, but he began to proclaim God's good news to all humanity. But it did not stop with just words, but he also brought the healing power of God and throughout the entire New Testament it was both the kingdom of God this preaching and proclaiming and teaching but also it was the demonstration of the gospel in great power friends and you sit in a church this morning where we believe that God is still proclaiming the truth of his gospel through the proclamation, through teaching, but also through the healing power of Jesus Christ that is available today. Why is it that during the, the communion elements we pray for healing virtue to flow because we believe that healing was paid for in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. We believe in the healing power that flows whenever a prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. We believe that Jesus still heals today. And not only do we believe that, we have seen it. We have seen over the last, just in my short tenure here, we have watched people being healed from a lifetime of ventilator work where one Sunday he had a ventilation. Next Sunday he said after 15 years he said I'm off my ventilator and I give praise to Jesus. We have seen people healed of cancer. A few weeks ago we announced a man healed from a tumor in his brain, in his skull there. We believe in the healing work of God, not just because it teaches it, but also because we've seen it. Well, what happens whenever God doesn't heal? I don't know. My responsibility is not to teach what not to believe. My job is to teach what to believe. I believe God can defend himself. Do I fully understand why some are healed and some aren't? No. But should that rattle our faith nonetheless and not proclaim the truth that God still heals? Absolutely not. Healing. And the forgiveness of sins was purchased at the cross of Calvary. And we believe that that work still continues today, friends. It's the work of the Lord. It's the work that we've been called to. It's the work that we've been commissioned to. But not only this, but not only the work of the Lord, but I love verse 36 and 37 that speaks of the eyes of the Lord. Verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds... He had compassion on them. You ever notice that you can see the same thing but have a few different perspectives on it? A number of years ago, they had these strange pictures that looked like radio waves and like kind of like pixelated things. And you had to stare long enough in order to see the real picture. Anybody remember those? My wife would go in, and, and she's an artist. She'd see them, and, you know, I, I just have to confess to you today, my wife isn't here. She's not feeling well this morning, and, and 
I would lie and say I saw them just to get her to stop asking me to look at it. Don't you see it? Yeah, baby, I see that dolphin swimming through the, the ocean. Yeah. I couldn't see it. It drove me crazy. You can see the same thing, but say it's, uh, your perspective is very different. It says whenever he saw the crowds. You know, Jesus saw with different eyes. Our eyes are so interesting. The eyes that we have, they're made up of over 2 million working parts. They say that, that the eyes are one of the main reasons why um, this view of macro evolution is not possible because of the complexity of the human eye. We blink 12 times every minute. We blink more than we talk. Well, at least most of us. So. Out of all the muscles in your body, the muscles that control your eyes are the most active. I don't know if you knew this, babies are born colorblind. So color does not come into the picture until a little bit later. And it's impossible to sneeze with your eyes open. Now I don't know if it's true. I heard if you have your eyes open, they'll pop out of your head. I've, I've never tried it, but just, just saying. <laughs> Scripture says that the eyes are the window to your soul. I believe there's something significant to that. Jesus, whenever he looked through his eyes, he didn't just see the natural, he saw the soul. And whenever he saw the crowds, he would see the noise, the busyness, the chaos. People haven't changed that much over the years. I mean, our, our dress has changed, our, our, our technology has changed, our hairdos have changed, our shoes have changed. But whenever Jesus saw people, he saw beyond all the surface stuff, and he saw the needs and the hurts. Oh, that we might see through Jesus' eyes. All that we might be able to see through the eyes of the Lord. So whenever we see our co-workers or our neighbors or our family members or, or whoever the Lord puts in our path, that we might see with his eyes. You know, the good shepherd saw us sheep differently. And the ailment of humanity has always been its separation from the good shepherd. He said he saw the crowds and had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What do we know about a shepherd? Much of what I understand about a shepherd I learned from King David whenever he wrote the 23rd Psalm where he says the Lord, right, is our shepherd. And I love, I love this entire passage. Sometimes we, we read this at funerals. Sometimes we read it in other settings. We, we teach it to our kids. But let me, let me back up to verse number one. It says, the, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. You know what? There are times in my life I don't have all that I need, I think. But you know, whenever I understand that the good shepherd knows what I have need even before I speak it, that the Lord has never allowed me to go without, that I can truly say I have all that I need in faith because I know the good shepherd knows in advance. And he always takes care of our need. Why, why can we walk without anxiety, filling our soul, without worry, consuming our hearts? Because we have a good shepherd that looks out for us. The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. It says this, it continues on in Psalm 23. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He restores my strength. Why, why does he lead us along these places? Why does he make us and let us rest? And Because so much of life drains us. But the good shepherd fills us. So much of life empties our strength, empties our joy, empties our perspective. But God, the good shepherd, whenever we release it all to him, we have all that we need and he fills us. He brings rest to our weary soul. What does he say of the scriptures? He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you 
Perhaps you're here this morning and you need rest in your soul. The good shepherd has what you have need of. All that you want comes from the good shepherd. He says, take my yoke upon you because it is easy and it is light. If you're carrying something that's not easy and not light, it's not from the good shepherd. So it's time to shed. Continues on. He guides me along paths of righteousness, bringing honor to his name. How is this possible in Christ? We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Even verse 4, it says, Even when I walk through the darkest of valleys, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. What do we learn in the New Testament? God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. He has given us a different spirit, and so even whenever we pass through those valleys of darkness, I will not be afraid, because we have a good shepherd. You see, Jesus looked at the crowds. He saw that he could deliver what they all needed, Male, female, old, young, rich, poor, it didn't matter. The human soul all needs the same thing. We're all made of the same stuff. And he says, your rod and your staff, interestingly enough, representing the word of God, it says, you protect and comfort me. The rod represents the rebuke and correction of the Lord, the training in righteousness, the words of life from God's word spoken over us. He says, verse 5, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You know what? The enemy is meant to harm you. God is able to turn into a blessing into your life. What is meant to destroy you, given over into the hands of the good shepherd, can lift you up. What is meant to bring you down can elevate you. Whenever you're going through the struggles, can I encourage you this morning? Give it to the good shepherd. And he will bless what looks like a curse. We have a good shepherd over our soul. Whenever Jesus saw the crowds, he understood what they needed. He said, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. We are a kingdom of priests, a holy nation before the Lord. He says, my cup overflows with blessings. Surely goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. What can separate us from the love of God? Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not height, not death, not life, not nothing can separate us. It will follow me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the good shepherd of our souls. This is why the apostle would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Because of our understanding of Christ as the shepherd, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Whenever you begin to see with the eyes of the Lord, you will feel with his heart and you will be moved with his hand. For the eyes see beyond the flesh and to the soul. Into the condition of our inner man. And then our work becomes not for the outward, but for the inward. And then in verse 38, he says this Ask the Lord of the harvest in the Lord's prayer here, the, the prayer that the Lord offers himself. He says, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into this harvest field. As he is walking throughout all the the, the towns and villages of that region there in Israel, as he's making his rounds throughout the Sea of Galilee, stopping the north side, the east side, west side, south side, as he heads down to Jerusalem, as he heads over to Galilee, he is there stopping, but he realizes that there's this great work of all humanity across this globe. 
And I love what he does here, and it's a model for you and I. He first says, ask the Lord of the harvest. You know, oftentimes whenever we see need, we, we, we begin to develop human strategy and human ingenuity. We have planning meetings and so forth. There's nothing wrong with all those elements, but there's a place that we need to ask God to activate his power to accomplish his work. Because in human strength, what we have been called and commissioned to do in this harvest field we call life, it is impossible. You cannot save anyone on your own. You can't even raise godly children apart from the miracle working spirit of God working through you. Apart from him, we can do nothing, friends. No matter how smart we are, no matter how resourced we are, the Lord Jesus understood this as he saw the crowd, he saw the need, and he first said, ask the Lord of the harvest. And before we turn any place else, no matter what need you have this morning, it might be in the area of your family, or your finances, your health, or an internal struggle that you're dealing with, or something of your heart or your mind, whatever it looks like for you, the place to begin is with the Lord of the harvest. The harvest of righteousness in your life, the harvest of grace over you, no matter what need you have, the place to begin is not with people, it's with the Lord. For those that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. No matter what the issue you are facing, the place to begin is on your knees seeking the face of God. Now, there are times whenever the Lord will begin to lead you to do something else following that. But I'm telling you this morning, there's no better place to begin. Jesus himself, recognizing the huge need, he didn't say, well, let's double this interior group. And if 12 men are good, 24 is twice as good. He said, no, 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 let's ask the Lord. For it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. And know oh, that we would not walk away on this Labor Day where we celebrate the work of our own hands and, and we get rest from the work of our own hands. And, and I thank God to be living in a nation that allows for that and provides for that. We have a great work ethic in our nation for the most part. And we thank God for all those things. But friends, our arms are short and at times grow weary. But praise God. He never rests. He never slumbers. Ask the Lord of the harvest. And what are we asking for? We ask him to send out laborers into the harvest field. The Lord Jesus prays for those who might respond with a yes. This three-letter word that makes us available where we say, here am I, Lord, send me. Despite what others say, despite what others have done, despite the obstacles, Lord God, I still say yes. Just even though I don't know what I'm even saying yes to in the very beginning, in faith I say yes. And whenever we say yes, we become the answer to Jesus' prayer. So let me ask you the question. Would you say yes today? No matter what that looks like, your calling will be different than my calling. Your work may be different than mine. But praise God, he has called us. He commissions us. He is desiring to send us. But he's saying, ask that the Lord of the harvest. There should be never a time in our life saying, you know what? I've done enough for the Lord. I'm just going to put up my laurels here. And, and it's time for somebody else to do it. Oh, you know, you know what, I am, I, you know, times whenever we feel burned out or something, it's because we haven't tapped into the source. It's not because the work is done. 
It's because we've tried to do it in human strength and we haven't trusted the Lord of the harvest strength. Or sometimes we get our attention on humanity. Because, by the way, they're made of the same stuff you are. And just like we drive ourselves crazy sometimes, sometimes we drive other people crazy. You do too. We all do. All right. It's not just the other people. We, we, we mutually drive one another crazy because we're imperfect. We fall short. We disappoint. But whenever we say we're going to go to the good shepherd, the one who provides for all of our needs, he knows what we need even before we ask. We can say, well, praise the Lord anyhow. I give it over to Jesus. We release those things before the Lord. You are God's answer to prayer. His prayer. And whenever we say yes before the Lord, whenever we say yes to him, it's in those moments that the Lord fills us as he sends us. Never in my life have I ever felt fully prepared, fully equipped whenever I said yes. In fact, most of the time I say yes, begin to walk out in insecurity in my life. Feeling like I lack. Feeling like, but it's as we take one step at a time that the Lord douses me with a new dose of his spirit, with a new dose of his strength, with a new pre- powerful um, portion of his spirit in my life. It is as we go, we are empowered. I'm looking forward to this fall. I've been praying about where God has taken us as a church throughout the entire month of October. We're going to be looking at the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I am believing that God is going to do a tremendous part. But I'm telling you, the Lord does not fill vessels that stay still. Well, Lord, you know, fill me with your power. What? For what? If we're not going, if we're not doing, if we're not speaking, if we're not in motion, he doesn't fill us with this power so we can sit in a pew. So we can watch Fox News or CNN News or, or, or I guess we got to mow our lawn once in a while, I was going to say that, especially after this rain. But he does it so that as we go, we are empowered with a fresh new dose of his Holy Spirit. And throughout the month of October, we're just going to be seeking God for a fresh move of his spirit in our lives. We're going to be praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be released. We're going to be praying for the healing power of God to be released, the gifts of God's spirit. Now, it's not humanity's work. We're just going to ask God to do what he does. And we're just going to trust him with his results. Because you can't make the Holy Spirit move. I can't make the Holy Spirit move. But we can present a place that's hungry for more of him. So the entire month of October. And whenever he sends us and we say yes, he fills us with his presence. The good shepherd. Would you bow in a word of prayer with me here today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this prayer of our Savior Jesus. That we should ask of you, Lord, for you are the Lord of the harvest. You rule over the harvest, you determine the harvest, you release. We thank you that you allow us to be a part of it, but you are the the Lord of all harvests. And Lord, as we ask you this day, I do ask you this morning in alignment with this word, that Lord, that you would send out workers into the harvest field. I pray, Lord God, that you would have put burdens on our hearts that we never saw coming, that you would provide visions for the future, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that whether it be in our own backyard, across seas, in our own four walls, that, Lord God, that you would allow your spirit to arise within us through the power that you have made available 
that we would not just do work for you, but Lord God, we would do harvest work commissioned by you. as we pause this weekend for most of us from our natural labor Holy Spirit we make room this morning to begin to show us the spiritual work you've called us to the eternal kingdom work the work that lasts for all eternity harvest work. We ask you, O oh Lord, open up doors that no man can shut. And as we go, as we say yes, we rely upon the work of your Spirit within us. every head I bowed and every eye closed or perhaps you're watching online even at the moment as Jesus looks upon the crowd not just here this morning perhaps as he sees your heart he, compassion is stirred within him because perhaps you're facing some real struggles this morning some real fears some real battles that you're facing today I don't know about you, I'm not afraid to say, Lord, I need you. Lord, over here, I need your touch this morning. I need your intervention. And perhaps you have some needs in your life. Can I encourage you before the Lord Jesus this morning as, as we have gathered in his name today, as we have lifted up his name and praise and worship, honored him in the communion, spoke of his word today. Today, if you have need in your life, you're facing a battle, you're fighting, you're fighting in your life. If you have a need, can I just encourage you right where you're at, lift up your hands and say, Lord, over here today. Lord, I need your touch this morning. It might be something physical. It might be a ministry development in your life. It might be a, a relational struggle that you're facing. It might be depression or anxiety that's gripping your heart. Whatever it is this morning, Lord, we lift our hands to you today, the good shepherd, and say, Lord, we need you this morning. Oh, we cry out to you this day, oh God. Oh, we surrender in our own strength, and Lord, we lean upon the everlasting arms of Christ our Savior today. Oh, we give it over to you, Lord, for that loved one that we've been praying for, but Lord, they haven't turned to you yet. Lord Jesus, we release them into your hands this morning. Oh, for that prayer that we've been praying for years. But, Lord, we haven't seen the fulfillment of it in the natural. Lord, we release it to you this morning once again. The anxiety would not fill our hearts, but the peace of God would transcend all understanding in Christ Jesus today. Oh, Lord Jesus, over here. Oh, as you look upon us, Lord. Oh, to Hallelujah, we look to you, the good shepherd. For in you, we have all that we need. Oh, we receive today as we trade our sorrows, as 
we trade our sickness, as we trade our worry, as we trade the burdens of this life for the joy of the Lord. We receive together in faith believing that you are the good shepherd. In his name, in your name, dear Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. We serve a good shepherd. Amen, friends.